Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm Mike Russo tonight. I'm standing in for our president who is not here, Matt Rodolsky. And um, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. This is a good crowd. Um, as all, well, I just wanted to take a, 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 a poll here. How many people here are currently members of the Historical Society? Can you raise your hand? Great. And for those of you who are not, we have all these applications on the back table there. You'll see them back there across from the goodie table. And we'd really love to, um, to have you guys help us out by becoming members. We also have an event coming up in June, <clears throat> which happens with the, um, uh, the Brantford Festival. And that's our strawberry festival. And if you've ever had the strawberries, it's a real treat with real whipped cream and the whole nine yards. So we're also looking for um, helpers for that as well. So if you're interested in doing any of those things, we have hulling on Friday and then we have the actual sale of the strawberries on Saturday. If you're interested in doing any of those things, just talk to me before you leave tonight. We'd love to have you. And um, now I'm gonna turn it over to our programs chair, Sue Winkle, if you wanna come up. Hi, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming. We're quite excited about tonight's program. Um, as uh, Mike said, I am the, uh, the program manager currently. So if anybody has any ideas for future programs, please uh, love to hear them. Come see me after the, uh, after the presentation tonight. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Stasha Healy, who will be sharing stories from her book, uh, Secret Connecticut. Uh, Stasha is a career travel writer and editor. She's been on the staff at Condé Nast Traveler and Fedors, and has worked as a freelance writer and editor for publications including Time Out and Fromers. Uh, most recently during the pandemic, she turned her attention to uh, right here in the state of Connecticut uh, and brought to life stories of some of the state's most intriguing people, places, and historical uh, events. And tonight she will be sharing some of those stories with us. So please join me in welcoming Sasha. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I'm going to be the 19th person to um, say, may the fourth be with you today. Um, so this book has 84 stories in it, and they're all very short. They're just uh, a spread each, so two pages each with photos. So it's um, very easily di digestible, and it's um, it was really fun to write. So um, like Sue said, I'm a travel writer and when the pandemic hit, um, now what? So I, people in, in all different fields had that same feeling, but you think travel and of course, um, there were really a lot of question marks. So they're um, part of a, um, an organization called the Society of American Travel Writers and there was a Zoom and there was um, a publisher on that Zoom who has um, different series of, of books. And one of them was the secret series. So there's, uh, if you're going to you know, Orange County, there's a secret Orange County. If you're going to Pittsburgh or wherever, there are different secret books. And um, they're all written by local writers because to, to know the secret knowledge, you have to know a lot about what you're writing about. You can't just parachute in and write a secret book. So there was the opportunity, um, I, I looked at the titles and there was no Secret Connecticut. And I thought, ooh, this is something I could do over the pandemic, my pandemic project. And um, so there are 84 different stories and I, how I approached it is I went to my local li library, I live in Greenwich. I went to my local library and I took out literally every book that had the word Connecticut in its title. <laughs> so um, the research phase was so much fun. I read Connecticut icons, Connecticut, um, you know, this day in Connecticut history, you name it. I've read about the gastronomy. Um, I've read about uh, witches, I've, like everything, every single topic. And um, it was a lot of fun. So 
This it came out in March of last year, and four days later, I was at a, a press conference um, at Aquila's Nest Vineyards, which is in Newtown, Connecticut. And I met this gentleman. Can anybody um, guess who that is with the mask on? It's Ned Lamont <laughs> holding my book. So thank you, Ned. So um, there are, it's called Secret Connecticut, Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure. So I, I picked some stories um, to share with you tonight, and I organized them by weird, wonderful, and obscure. But many of them can, are, are cross um, categories. So, but this one, um, definitely the first one is weird. So we're pretty near this place. Has anybody been here? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, what's in those jars? Brains. <laughs> so, um, it was named after doc Dr. Harvey Cushing, a neurosurgery pioneer, and it's free to visit. He looks pretty creepy in this photo, but he was definitely not nefarious. If you had to have brain surgery in the early 1900s, you, you would have wanted Harvey to hold the scalpel. He was an early adopter of administering anesthesia, monitoring blood pressure, and using stems and tourni tourniquets to curtail, curtail bleeding. So you would definitely want all those things if you're having brain surgery. And the center is a, uh, a unique record of early neurosurgery with specimens and patient notes and patient photos. And these photos, I think, are just so poignant and haunting. I'm going to pause here for a minute um, so you can study them. And I think his photography skills are really extraordinary. And the Cushing Center also documents the doctor's service in World War I, his artistic and athletic skills, and his 1926 Pulitzer Prize in biography. So in addition to being a neurosurgery pioneer, he won a Pulitzer Prize. And he has redeemed himself in this picture from the earlier creepy one with the pediatric patient and being on the, uh, the stamp here. So, that is Dr. Harvey Cushing. And this one um, is also very weird. If you look at this, it looks very pretty. But who's been here? Right. So um, you might be thinking, what is, what is a mine doing on the, the grounds of a prison? But the prison was the mine. And if you put yourself back at the early stages of uh, our country's founding, you had, you had criminals, you had, you had to have a place to put them, and you didn't have a lot of funding. So there was a mine, it was not being used. Why not put the prisoners down in the mine? You don't have to build the building. You just put them down there, take the ladder away, and that's it. So, up to, oops, up to 60 people were in, I, this, these are um, pictures from when I visited um, last summer. Um, up to 60 people were down in this mine um, at one time and it was cold and damp, always like about 52 degrees and no one bathed and there were no toilet facilities. And a former inmate noted in his 1854 autobiography, quote, armies of fleas, lice, and bedbugs covered every inch of the floor, which itself was covered in five in inches of slippery, stinking filth. Um, no surprise that people wanted to escape. And the very first Newgate prison inmate in 1773 escaped 18 days after being left alone 75 feet underground. The wardens just thought if you took the, the, um, the ladder away that they couldn't escape. They just didn't think that somebody would come up with a rope and get them out, <laughs> which is what happened. And over the course of um, the, the time that the, prisoner, the prison was in, um, had prisoners, there were about 10% of, of um, prisoners escaped. And it was in service for 54 years and it closed in 1827 and it's been a visitor attraction almost ever, ever since. It's a very cool place to visit if you haven't been there. And this one, um, 
the, the, the old state house isn't weird on its own, but the Stewart Museum was founded on being weird. And um, this is the story of the Stewart Museum. When the old state house was new, when it first opened in 1796, a man named Reverend Joseph Stewart asked for a painting room. So he was a painter in addition to being a reverend. Um, and he had the idea of, I'm just gonna paint in the old state house and sell my paintings. But he was, his paintings were described as wretched. So he switched gears and he created a museum in quotation marks, natural, uh, natural and artificial curiosities. So these are um, some advertisements he placed in the Hartford Current, telling potential visitors about what they'd find at his museum and also asking for people to bring him items. People came to see the largest Bengal tiger ever seen, an English weather station, a number of beautiful birds and other animals from the island of Japan, a sword from a swordfish four feet in length. A two-headed calf was a big sensation and a replacement can be seen today. And his displays were popular. And in 1808, he moved his museum to an extension he built on his nearby house. And I wonder what his wife thought about that. When he died in 1822, the museum closed, but was reopened two years later. A bunch, of, and it was opened by a group. So a group of gentlemen thought, oh, this was really popular. You know, let's take, take it over and keep it going. And one of those um, gentlemen had the last name of Wadsworth. So what institution did he found? Wadsworth Athenaeum. But this came first, this idea came first as for a museum. And another um, museum also well known in Connecticut was the Barnum Museum. And that came after this one as well. And, and that one was very well known for oddities also. But Stewart came first. And so this is weird, but it's also obscure. And in some ways, it's very wonderful. Um, the bottom picture there is my daughter taking the photo of the crocodile um, up there. And that's my hand showing how big that claw is. It's a cool space. And of course, if you haven't been to the old state house um, in a while, or if you've never been, definitely go. It's, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, that's the Gilbert Stewart painting right there of Washington. Um, and there's this really, really good um, museum uh, exhibitions on the bottom floor. Okay, on to wonderful. Who has heard of Sergeant Stubby? Okay, I got you on this one. <laughs> so there was a stray dog from New Haven and he became a national celebrity. A friendly brindle puppy, I had to look up brindle, I'm not really a dog person. So brindle um, means like the, the, the coat for people who didn't know. Um, and the, so he had a very stubby tail, so he was called stubby and the sergeant part I will get to. So he wandered into a training camp near the Yale Bowl in October, 1917. The soldiers of the 102nd Infantry 26th Yankee Division were so taken by Stubby that Private um, Robert Conroy smuggled him aboard the SS Minnesota in an overcoat. His CO discovered him, but after Stubby saluted, and you can see him saluting in that um, statue, um, that's in Middletown. After Stubby saluted, he was allowed to stay and accompany the soldiers into, ba into battle. And there is Stubby with his own gas mask. Stubby warned the 102nd about gas attacks, found wounded soldiers on the battlefield, and was wounded himself. In the Argonne, Stubby spotted a German soldier doing reconnaissance on the, in the Allied trenches and pinned him down and barked until somebody came to get him. And for that, he was promoted to sergeant for capturing an enemy spy, becoming the first dog in the United States Armed Forces to be given rank. By the time he returned home, he had served in 17 battles. Stubby's stories swept the nation. He led parades and met Presidents Wilson, Harding, and Coolidge, and none other than General John Pershing, the commanding general of the United States Armies, um, presented him with a medal in 1921. Then Stubby went to college, becoming the mascot of the Georgetown Hoyas football team when Conroy attended law school. When this canine hero died in 1926, his New York Times obituary 
was much longer than many people's. It was half a page long and three columns wide. The stray dog from New Haven had saved lives and captured the heart of a nation. And you can learn more about him at the West Haven Veterans Museum and Learning Center, and also at the Smithsonian. So that, um, that's Sergeant Stubby stuffed at the Smithsonian. And there's also an animated movie about him with um, Gerard de Perdue playing uh, a, a French cook, it, which is it's a very sweet movie. So that's Sergeant Stubby. Now, first in flight. There's a lot of controversy about this one, but let me tell you the story as I learned it. So born in Germany as Gustav Weisskopf in 1874, this man became Bridgeport resident Gustav Whitehead and he worked in the nascent field of aviation. At dawn on August 14, 1901 in Fairfield, he unfolded the wings of his 21st attempt at a manned aircraft and flew approximately a mile at an elevation of 50 feet. Two years later, the Wright brothers claimed the first flight. There has been much controversy about the first in flight title of the years, but when researching an aviation documentary for the Smithsonian Channel, the historian John Brown found more than 250 previously unknown newspaper articles about Whitehead's aircrafts and flights, many front page items, and those were only found because over the years more and more had been digitized. The Bridgeport Herald was the original known documented source. The writer accompanied Whitehead on the flight. North Carolina and Ohio, of course, refute Whitehead's claim, as does the Smithsonian, which is actually under legal obligation to support the rights. But in 2013, the Connecticut General Assembly and the governor recognized Whitehead as the first to pilot, and there are a lot of qualifications here, but these, this is what it, the first to pilot a manned, powered, heavier than air aircraft on a controlled, sustained flight. Whitehead is definitely more of a sensation in Germany, there's a museum dedicated to him in his hometown of Leitershausen, a postal seal, and even a musical that drew 13,000 people. And now I'm switching gears um, to a story I, I learned when I was working at the Greenwich Historical Society um, about a house and who notable people who lived there over the years. So this is an 1887 map of Greenwich with a neighborhood called Hangroot Circled. The area is marked on maps of the 1800s as colored settlement and hang root, probably due to the practice of hanging vegetables and stealing root cellars. Free people of color settled there in the early 1800s and owned lands and homes. Alan Green, a free black man, purchased the land in 1839 and built the house in 1845. In the photo on the left, notice the figures on the right side of the frame, and that photo on the right, it could be the opening of a wonderful movie. The painter, John Henry Twachman, founding member of the Costco American Impressionist Art Colony, which was headquartered at the Bush Holly House in Greenwich, bought the Allen Green home in 1890. He and fellow painters, including Theodore Robinson and Child Hassam, used his home, his children, and the surrounding landscapes as subjects. And then the, the next uh, resident you will recognize um, and the little, his little frog friend. Jim Henson and his family lived in the very same house from 1964 to 1971. At the 2017 annual meeting of the Greenwich Historical Society, daughter Cheryl Henson recalled, I love this quote, it was an ideal setting for a young family, an old home full of nooks and crannies, back stairs, an old barn, a place full of history and story, bordered by a forest and a wonderful babbling brook. While living there, the Henson clan grew to include five children and six cats, plus um, other pets and um, various fuzzy monsters. In the spring of 1969, before the first episode of Sesame Street aired, Jim treated lucky North Street Elementary students to a performance that included Kermit and Rolf. That is Cheryl Henson setting up um, the dollhouse. So the whole Henson family um, created a dollhouse of the house that they were living in and they handmade all the furniture, the, the quilt to go on the little tiny beds. And, it's, and it was, she was so happy putting it back together. It brought back wonderful memories for her. And um, uh, uh, Oscar and Grover need no introduction. And um, so the, the lady in the panel on the, the left 
is a descendant of Alan Green, the first uh, the builder of the home. Then it's Susan Larkin, who um, wrote the definitive um, book about the, the, the cost cob American Impressionist Art Colony, Cheryl Henson, and that's John Nelson, who has been the steward of the house. Um, so he bought it from the Hensons, so he's been the steward ever since. It's not a wonderful story about that house. Don't you wonder about who's lived in your house and the stories that happened there? Okay, now we're on to obscure. So if you think about, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but um, I lived in New York City for a long time and, and I think of people wearing uniforms in parades on, on horses as mounted police, but that is not the case here in Connecticut. So this is a very special unit called the First Company Governor's Horse Guards and it was founded in Hartford in 1778 by um, Revolutionary War veterans. It's not very many people who can get up in the morning and mount a horse and go to work on a job that's remarkably um, consistent and has remained that way since the 18th century. Their first deployment was greeting new President George Washington on October 19, 1789, when he visited Hartford. The unit fought in the War of 1812, protected US interests against Pantovia in 1916, and during World War I served in France as part of the 101st Machine Gun Battalion. And during World War II, they operated an anti-aircraft artillery on American soil, and many members deployed in the South Pacific. It's part of the Connecticut militia, along with the Army National Guard, the Air National Guard, a second horse guard troop, and two units of foot guards. They are trained in emergency operations and traffic and crowd control, and can be called to active service. The troop cares for and trains 10 donated horses in Avon, their barn dates to 1880. Every summer they do field training that includes weaponry marches and mounted and dismounted uh, close order drills. And they go on overnight bivouac using the same camping and horse tying me methods used for the troop for more than two centuries. And um, I'm very lucky to have these photos um, donated by Deb Key. She's a very talented um, photographer. And um, she's one of many people who are very generous with me with their, uh, their time and their talents to, for me to be able to tell these wonderful stories about Connecticut. And I found it very surprising that this unit does not get paid. They're completely volunteer. And if anybody's interested, you don't have to have any military training or horse training, they, they, will, they will train you. And they, um, if you want to just watch them drill, um, it's open to the public every Thursday um, at 7 p.m. Okay, now, um, that's obviously not Connecticut. Why, okay, who, where is this? Anybody notice the mountain? Hawaii. Hawaii, right, right, right. Okay, why, why am I talking about Hawaii? I will get there. Um, the, well, the title will tell you foreign mission school if anybody knows what that is and what the tie is, but I will get there. So, um, way before the resorts lined the coast of the Big Island, um, a boy Connecticut would come to know as Henry Obakaya was born Henry, I'm going to say it wrong, Opukahaya, and he um, experienced great trauma. In, the seven, in 1796, when Henry was about 10 years old, King Kamehameha's warriors invaded. Henry fled with his family, but they were caught, and um, he witnessed his parents being killed, and he took um, his infant um, brother on his back, and, and while he was running an arrow, killed his, killed his brother. I mean, it's so horrible. And then he was, he was made a slave by, by his captors, but then an uncle rescued him. He was a kahuna, a chief, um, like a, what's the, the right um, terminology? But he was, um, he was able to, to take him in, but, um, but at that point, his aunt was also killed and, and he witnessed that. And so what, he did not blame him when he saw a ship um, in the harbor and he ran, he swam out to it and he said, take me away. And circling back, he ended up in Connecticut. So that's Henry. Um, the ship was called the Triumph and it was, it was trading with China. And um, on board, he was tutored in by a Yale divinity student. Um, he learned English. And he, he made his way, his way to the Yale campus and um, a relative of the university's president saw him crying, frustrated because he wanted an education and 
In the throes of the, the, the Second Great Awakening, Obakaya lived with and was tutored at the homes of Yale President Reverend, Reverend Dr. Timothy Dwight and Reverend Samuel Mills of Torrington. He converted to Christianity and expressed a desire to return to Hawaii as a missionary. Henry inspired the founding of the Foreign Mission School in Cornwall, which educated 100 students of color, many Hawaiian and Native American from 1817 to 1826. The Foreign Mission School um, Academy building burned down in the 19th century, but the school steward house still stands. And that's the house. And before Henry, the Hawaiian language was only oral. And what do we know about Connecticut and dictionaries? Webster. Webster, right. So Henry modeled a dictionary of the Hawaiian language on the, the very new dictionary that Webster um, made. And we have him to, th to thank for being able to communicate um, with people who spoke the Hawaiian language. And that opened the doors to more missionaries going to Hawaii to education to assim assimilation. You can you know see both sides of that. Is that good or is it bad? Um, but it it led to that and um, and it led to Hawaii becoming a state in 1959. And that was Henry. It's so he wrote a book, a memoir, and it became a bestseller. However, it's a he had a tragic ending. He died. Um, let's see, how old was he? Um, he was young. Okay, he died uh, of typhoid in 1818 and Reverend Lyman Beecher eulogized him. And one, one day um, in 1992, so the story doesn't end there. One day in 1992, a descendant of Obakaya's in Hawaii awoke in the middle of the night with this feeling like, I have to bring him home. I need to repatriate his remains. And she worked with um, the state archeologist and did just that. So now this um, bright, charismatic young man who is credited with bringing Christianity to Hawaii and with American education and ultimately statehood now overlooks the bay where he first swam to that ship. He's a very well-known person um, in, in Hawaii um, and not as much here, but we hope to change that. That was a quote of his. He wanted, he wanted to go back and see Hawaii, but he was never able to, but now his remains are there. So we like to think that he's there. Okay, so now Gatsby. So how many people have either read the book or seen one of, or two of the movies? We know the story of Gatsby, right? Okay, but what a lot of people don't know is that Gats the character of Jay Gatsby was based on an actual person in Connecticut and his house still stands today and you can go see it. So I never knew any of this and I, I'm a big Gatsby Fitzgerald fan. So I was all over this story. So in 1920, um, Zelda and, and F. Scott Fitzgerald got married and where did they honeymoon? Westport of all places. And that's the house where they, they, um, where they honeymooned and they rented it. And it's, it borders um, the, 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 the Longshore Club Park. The, the name of the building now is the Inn at Longshore, um, and which is um, an inn, but it's, it's a restaurant and they do catering and um, lots of private events. It's a very pretty place. So this house um, that they rented was right next to this property. And um, it was 175 acres and it belonged to a mystery millionaire named Frederick E. Lewis. He inherited the equivalent of $240 million on his 21st birthday. He flew planes, skippered yachts, drove race cars, and had stables full of Arabian horses. Of course he did. He threw parties, so that's, that's Frederick Lewis. He threw parties. This is actually a picture of one of his parties, um, and it could be a still from, from uh, you know, a movie. So, um, he threw this one party had um, 800 cars full of people. Um, Henry, Harry Houdini did a show. Um, there was a full circus and many big name entertainers of the day and John Philip Sousa even wrote music for it. The Fitzgeralds could see across the bay where another grand estate 
had a lawn that rolled to a beach and a long dock with a green light. Barbara Pro Solomon grew up in that estate and wrote a 1996 New Yorker article connecting the dots to Westport and the Fitzgeralds. It went largely unrecognized until two Westport residents took up the cause, spending years researching a book and producing a documentary that provided strong evidence that Westport is the setting for both the Fitzgerald's writings. You can literally walk in the Fitzgerald's footsteps on a longshore walking tour organized through the Westport Historical Society. And that's an aerial uh, period photo. Okay, now I'm gonna... Now I'm going to end with um, I'm going to end with um, with a, a little vocabulary lesson. Um, I'm a lifelong learner, and I, I'm a writer, and I love words. And um, I had never seen either of these two mm -hmm. words before. So troveritz is a female troubadour, and a joggleress is. A, a female troubadour of the lower classes. So troveritz were of the upper classes. And why am I talking about this? Because um, in 1991, Connecticut hired a state troubadour and we've had one ever since. So Connecticut has um, a woman named um, Nikita Waller is, is our troveritz. And I thought that was a very fun fact. So um, that's the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to answer questions and also um, have comments if um, you have certain experiences of places I've talked about or places I haven't. Uh, I've been to, there. like I said, there are 84 stories in this book. If you have a question or comment about something else or if you want to share something that you think should be in the next Secret Connecticut, which might happen, um, or if, you know, to be included, I have a, a monthly newsletter and it's free and you can just sign up on my website. I don't sell any, you know, your information. Um, if you wanted to, um, you know, I, 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 I curate interesting things that I, I think are interesting that I've learned recently about, um, in, you know, in the previous month about things that are happening in, in Connecticut. Um, and I, you can, if you're interested in my book, you can take it out from the library. You can um, find it wherever books are sold and I have them also on my website and I have a few here too. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? And this one is, I worked at the Ministry of Medicine at Yale. Oh. And along with the Cushing Museum, there, they also had different uh, pieces of equipment that they used. So if you go there, you can see that it's, it's sort of scary. Some of the stuff that they used was sort of scary. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Regarding the Connecticut horse farm, there's 10 horses carrying bars are all volunteers. Where does the funding come from? Do they participate in parades? Yes, they do. They they participate in, in parades and um, and they are, are called for crowd control at certain events also. Um, and it's all private funding. Yeah. Um, I don't know that offhand. Um, I would say maybe 20 ish. I'm not sure. But um, they're always looking for, for people. Is that really the on the old Brewster I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it, but I don't know if it's the old Brewster estate. It's not. Where are you looking at? In Avon. Yeah. But I think there used to be horses in the Huh. This big stone wall around the hole. Did you say where the other is? No, no, I'm from Greenwich. Sorry, I, I don't know uh, all these. Every nook of every cranny of all the towns, but um, every town has so much, so many stories to share. So I tried in, in my book, uh, somebody asked me recently, how did you come up with your 84 stories? And um, I just tried to have a variety. So a variety of locations, a variety of, of subject matter, a variety of time periods. Um, 
and uh, and it's it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I I was interviewed recently by a woman um, who's on a radio show, and um, she had grown up going to her grandmother's um, farm in Ellington, and she was Jewish. And before my story about um, Jewish farming history in Connecticut, she never knew the bigger picture and how. Uh, anyway, so that's it's a, it's one of the stories in the book, but. Um, I'm, it's a very nice thing when I hear that, that people are connected to their heritage um, with the, these stories that I uncovered. And, and a, a great source, if you don't um, know about it, it's called um, Connecticut Explored. It's a magazine of Connecticut history. Have you all heard of that? Yeah, it's, it's a really wonderful magazine. Connecticut Explored. It's a, it's a magazine, it's quarterly. And um, I used it as a source for two of my stories. Yes. Do you have a future book in the author? Um, um, the publisher wants me to write a book, A um, Hundred Best Things, Connecticut. So it's, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, you didn't hear the question. So the, the question was, do you have another book um, coming? So the answer is a maybe. So um, I'm considering doing a book, A Hundred Best Things, Connecticut, which um, will, will cover um, attractions and uh, restaurants and um, shops. So it's it's uh, more comprehensive. It's not just um, storytelling. It's it's um, different experiences you can have in Connecticut. So I might do that because with all my experience writing about Connecticut, um, I think it would be more. Uh, I think it would come more easily <laughs> than than this book, which took a lot of research. It took two months of research, like reading constantly, and then two months of writing it. Um, but I'm, I'm not knocking that. It was, it was a lot of fun. And visiting places too. And visiting places, yes. You told me that just to speak locally. Yeah. Not to put you on the spot, but there's a there's a um, uh, there's a story about thimbles. Right. Story? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, I I had been to the thimbles, but not on a thimble. I had you know taken the the, the tour, um, but I wanted to write about the thimbles, but I didn't know what to write. So I, um, I got hooked up with somebody who, who owns a, an island, <laughs> a house on an island. And, um, and so I, I just found myself in, in October, so there was nobody around standing on a dock with my phone going, okay, I'm getting in a boat with a random guy, okay. <laughs> But he was lovely um, and he gave me a lot of uh, history that he knew of and told me about the community and, and all of that. And so um, so that, that was really wonderful. I had a, I had a really good time um, writing this book and connecting with, with people like that. And nobody turned out to be an axe murderer, so that's good. <laughs> That would lead to another book. It would lead to another book <laughs> if, if I were the one uh, still surviving. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very can much. I'm oh, sorry. Can we see? Oh, sure. Yeah, I have I have books here. You can you know come up afterwards and take a look. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs>